but we have been studying spiritual warfare for some time now and we've come to that part of Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul exhorts us if we're going to be successful in other words remember he told us to stand and the idea is we're to stand upon the battlefield and one of the pieces of armor that we we need to have and we don't typically think about this when we think of soldiers but it's a it's a critical piece of the the armament is the shoes Paul likens the shoes to the shoes of the gospel of peace and we are to wear them and so as we started this part of our message or part of our, our series here dealing with the gospel shoes we've looked at the great commission in other words the king of kings and lord of lords the one who uh, arose from the dead has told us based upon the authority that's given to him and all authority both on heaven and in earth we are to go and make disciples of the nations and then he taught us how to do that we baptize them uh, we teach them all things that he has commanded and the idea of teaching them here is he's not like a uh, university professor that says well you might want to consider all these things that I'm telling you after all you might get a good grade you might not he's the king of kings and lord of lords that says you are to teach them all things with what in so that we might follow them we are to bring all of our lives under the submission of Christ and his teachings and that's what it means to be a disciple we have seen that we are to be ambassadors of Christ and as ambassadors we are to take the message of reconciliation to the world so part of the gospel and this is so important you can't say I'm going to put the gospel shoes on and be completely oblivious completely ignorant of what the gospel what the good news is because you might be putting the wrong shoes on you might be bringing the wrong gospel to the nations and so we're to be ambassadors of Christ and part of that gospel message is the message of reconciliation I know people don't like to hear this but um, if we are of Adam we are born enemies of God we are enmity with him because there's true alienation as God thrust Adam our first father out of the garden the second Adam has come in to bring what Paul calls in Romans 5 the reconciliation and so we need to understand we're no longer at war with God in Christ. We have been brought to peace with God. But more than just with peace, in the idea of reconciliation, we're at friendship with God. And then we looked at another important element of the gospel found in Galatians 4 where we saw that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. To do what? To redeem us and to make us children of God. I mean, the good news and the riches we have in Christ just continue to get bigger and bigger, and I hope you understand the goodness of the good news as it resonates with you to consider that, okay, I'm no longer an enemy of God, that's good, but I'm a friend of God, certainly that'd be good, but I've become sons and daughters of God. That's what Christ has come to um, accomplish, and that's the good news. And so we need to remember part of the warfare that we're in is to call people out from the kingdom of darkness. We're to call them out of the kingdom of darkness. We're to call them into God's dear son. And so what the shoes do is they take us to the battlefield and they keep us on the battlefield as we are plundering Satan's goods. And as we plunder Satan's goods, as we call those who are in the kingdom of darkness to come out, we need to understand in every warfare there's going to be opposition, there's going to be conflict. Would you find it strange that a World War II uh, soldier, as he goes into Europe, he gets there and he realizes, oh, the Germans are going to shoot back. Wouldn't you find that odd that they would find that surprising? We should not find it odd that when we go to plunder Satan's good, he's not going to like it. And those who love being in the kingdom of darkness are going to oppose, they're going to bring conflict. It is the nature of being a Christian soldier. And one of the tactics that the enemies of the cross are going to use and going to challenge is the veracity of the message that you bring. So what I want to do this morning, turn over to Romans 1. I want us to look at some words of Paul who took the gospel to some very skeptical, I'm sorry, skeptical, skeptical um, cultures. Those who did not believe the message, those who had been sitting in, in darkness, they were very skeptic about this. Let me use that word. Let me try to get that one out of my mouth. But turn over to Romans 1. I mean, he just, a lot of times we read through the introduction, and there's a lot in these introductions, particularly in Paul's letters. Let me just show you some things here. <clears throat> Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Notice this. This is what I want to focus on this morning. Separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. <clears throat> 
And so when Paul wrote this letter, when he writes these particular words here, he had never been to Rome. And what he's doing is he's introducing himself to the church. He's letting them know, I want to come to Rome. And here in the first chapter he'll say, he'll tell them, I want to come to the imperial city. I want to preach the gospel. But at the end of the letter, he tells them, I also want to come because I want to go to Spain. And I want you guys to help me get over to Spain. But within this letter, he's going to expound upon the gospel. He was there when he wrote this letter. He penned it from the city of Corinth. And so, turn over to, hold your place here in Romans 1. We're going to come right back. But go over to 1 Corinthians 2 because uh, I think, you know, a lot of times what keeps us from sharing the gospel is, you know, um, the opposition that is out there. But sometimes we like to make excuses about our skills and our capabilities and things like that. Let me try to squash that real quickly because when you think of Paul, if you think, yeah, if I was like Paul, I, I would, I'd be better suited to do this. But notice how Paul talks about himself in 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And it's obvious when we read these opening words of chapter 2 here, uh, there's two features that are absent from his preaching ministry there in the city of Corinth. First, he tells us that he did not come with excellency of speech. So if you struggle with speech, go to Paul. You can't use that one as an excuse. Secondly, he, did, he tells us, I didn't come in wisdom. Now that first phrase, excellency of speech, in all likelihood refers to the manner of his communication, where as the second phrase deals with the content of his message. In other words, he didn't meddle with wisdom of words. And this is something the Greeks sought after. In other words, they were not interested in godly wisdom that can only be revealed by God himself, but rather they wanted worldly. They wanted wisdom that was derived from man. So look at it again. I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And so what Paul's doing here is he's saying, I didn't come with excellence of speech like a Greek orator. Uh, I didn't come with wisdom coming in and talking about philosophical Greek speculation. That's not how I came. But look what he says in verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that phrase persuasive in this verse has this idea of being intentionally deceitful. Listen to how A.T. Robson comes to this. He says, Corinth put a premium on the veneer of false rhetoric and thin thinking. In other words, these words were directed by worldly wisdom. And so Paul's telling them, that's not how I came. You know, when we were going out in one of the little colleges here that we went to go speak at a few years back, you know, that was one of the concerns. You know, well, how do you deal with these, quote, intellectuals? You deal with them the same way Paul did. I'm not coming there to try to outsmart them and use my wits and try to be more clever than they are. I'm just going to bring the truth of the gospel to them. <clears throat> So Paul's informed these Christians, I'm renouncing any kind of manipulative techniques of persuasion that would have been used by the Greek orator. Look what he says in verse 4 again. He says, And my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And notice that Paul emphasizes this word demonstration. That word means proof or evidence or verification. It's a word used in Greek literature that of an orator would use to justify the validity of his argument. It was a term used in the court of law for testimony. One said it this way, a term signifies that no one is able to refute the proof that is presented. And what caused the message to be so forceful, what caused the message to be so persuasive was the intervention and power of God and the Holy Spirit. And notice what Paul is saying there. I did not cling or depend on on my wits, how clever, uh, how fast thinking I am on my feet. He says, I'm dependent upon the intervention and power of God. And so we hear, we see in these verses, Paul's not dependent upon his own intellect, but rather he relied on the power of God. And so this tells me a lot concerning the message that he preached and the way he attempted to preach it. And so I think it'd be wise for us to take note of what Paul's saying here. Everyone, I think, you know, when you read these different uh, denominations and different groups out there, they're always looking for power and impact, right? The problem is, when we talk about this, the question is, are we looking in the right place? Maybe back to the Middle Ages where the church peddled indulgences through relics 
And so if you pay to see the relics of, say, John the Baptist's beard or wood from the cross or nails from the cross or clothes of the apostle, you'd receive an indulgence from the church. Think about how easy it would be to deceive someone if that's where they thought the power was displayed. So back in the mid-centuries or a medieval period, they desired to see power displayed in their life, and that's how the church used that to manipulate them. That's not the kind of power Christ is offering here. I mean, think about the Catholic Church and some Protestant denominations who, who try to seek pro, uh, power uh, in the elements of the sacraments. They seek power in the water. They seek power in the bread or the wine. They're always seeking power. Or think about the charismatics. They're always seeking power. Well, Paul's talking about a particular kind of power. Paul's talking about the power of the Spirit of God, the power of the truth of God. And when we think about the truth and the truth of the power of the Spirit is that he sent, He was sent. Let's go back and ask. What is your view of the Holy Spirit? Why was he sent? Well, Jesus tells you in John 16. He was sent to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. There's real power there. And those that exclude these principles from their teaching are bringing in falsehood and thereby denying the true power of that can actually save someone. And, and we need to understand that he's talking about the power of the truth, which comes through God's divine revealed will. And he's talking about the power of the Spirit. And so they both go together. And this is one of the reasons, for example, we, we emphasize you learning how to read and study the Bible so that you know that truth. And you carry real power with you when you share the gospel. Now this brings us back to the message of Romans. Because I want us to understand the veracity of the message. Turn back to Romans 1. I want to begin our discussion uh, with this idea of the trustworthiness of the message. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated, notice, to the gospel of God. Paul says that he's been separated to something. He's been separated to the gospel. The word means good news, glad tidings. And based on everything we've taught over the last several weeks, I hope you're beginning to understand and put together the pieces what is the gospel? And the good news is that there is a victory of deliverance. There's a victory of salvation by God. God steps in. He intervenes on our behalf. And so this idea of a gospel is important to understand. In, in this particular letter, he uses it six times. And it forms the very thesis, the very heart of his letter here to the Romans. James Montgomery Boyce said this, Romans was written to make this great gospel of God more widely known. And so we're introduced to the word gospel early on in the book of Romans. But I want you to notice that we're introduced to the gospel. It's not just any good news. It's the gospel of God. And so we need to think of it this way. It is a good news that comes from God. This means that this good news originated. This good news was sourced in God. Therefore, it's God's gospel. This means Paul did not invent this, but rather it was something that was revealed to him by God, and this means that it was entrusted to him. So our first point under the trustworthiness of the message is that it comes from God. So think about when we think about the trustworthiness of the gospel, think of the origin of the message, number one. The gospel comes from God. So do you see what this means? It's not a message of human speculation. It was not just one more religion added to the list of other religions. Paul says this is the gospel of God. It's the good news for a lost world. And the moment you take away uh, this content of this good news of, to a lost world, you're taking away the drive for evangelism. So this is good news. This is glad tidings that comes from God. Now the reason why the apostle was so anxious to show uh, this doctrine coincided with the Old Testament um, because the church at Rome was made up partly of Jews. And so if you read through the book of Romans, what you're going to see is that he's constantly quoting from the Old Testament. And we can learn how to interpret the Old Testament. We can learn how to use the Old Testament by reading the book of Romans and understanding how the Apostle Paul used it. But he wanted to show them that the Christian faith was built upon the foundation of their prophets. And so this was given to reassure them of their faith. So think about it. For the most part, your countrymen have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So if you're a Jew in Rome... You're trying to understand, well, why did all these other Jews reject the Messiah? Paul's trying to establish an apologetic here that's rooted in the Old Testament. It also shows us his understanding of the authority of the Scriptures. So since the Old Testament predicted the work of Christ, because it's authoritative, Paul submits to it. So this shows us the reverence that Paul had for the Old Testament. 
In other words, it teaches me that Paul did not see the Old Testament as obsolete or useless. And so when we read the Old Testament, or if you meet some of these folks that are out there in the church and say, well, you know, the Old Testament's really not that relevant. I'm a New Testament Christian. You're missing on one of the main foundations that God has given to us because the Old Testament has the good news embedded all throughout it. And so what Paul does is Paul reveals the mysteries that are hidden in the Old Testament. And so notice here, uh, Paul is going to teach the Romans that if the promises predicted in the Old Testament are true, then this is proof that the gospel is from God. So it's a trustworthy message. So Paul, to emphasize the trustworthiness of the message, talks about the origin of the message. It comes from God. Number two, we see the confirmation of the message. I understand the origin of the message, but I've also got to see the confirmation of this message. Look at verse 2. Which he, God, promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So we see God promised the gospel beforehand. This means something took place in the past. This tells me also God was personally involved. And when you look at it, it was something that was factual. It was certain. And so what I want you to get out of this verse is that the gospel is certainly good news, but it's not new news. Paul's making it clear that the gospel is not something new and novel that he derived with some other guys uh, there in the synagogue. It's always been there. It's always been in the Old Testament scriptures. Martin Luther said it this way, Christianity did not originate by accident are in the fate of the stars as many empty-headed people pursue. But it became what it was to be uh, by the certain counsel and premeditated ordination of God. And, and this is, for example, when he uses language about the, the premeditated ordination of God, he's just borrowing language from the Scriptures. Do you remember in Titus 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to Godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God had an eternal purpose, an eternal plan that he accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ. There is no afterthought here. The gospel was there in eternity past before the foundation of the world. And it is being revealed incrementally, progressively, in the Old Testament. And so when I come to Romans 1, 2, which he promised before through his prophets, I need to see here the origin and the confirmation. It's the gospel of God. It's sourced in God. It comes from God. And it is confirmed in the Old Testament. Now this helps us out here because many times we hear about you know, how relatively new Christianity is compared to other religions. And you need to be aware of these arguments because if you're going to put the gospel shoes on and you're going to go out there, these, quote, enlightened thinkers that are out there this day are going to hit you with these types of object, uh, objections. Christianity is relatively new. New compared to what? Right? Barnhouse says this, one of the commonest arguments of skeptics of Christianity is that Christianity is a young religion and that there were oriental religions and that there were long before. When anyone brings that argument to me, I ask one question. Just when do you date the time of Christ? Now that generally stops them for a moment, he says. If they say the time of Christ was a mere 20 centuries ago, well, we can take them to the scriptures and show that Christ was everywhere indicated before the day baby Jesus was born in the world. And then he asks the question, what if Buddha were born in the flesh before Jesus? The fact that Jesus Christ is the creator God who made the cells that became the body of Buddha stops all arguments. And so when we talk about the gospel that was proclaimed by Paul, we have to step back into eternity past. We have this eternal purpose by the counsel of the triune Godhead. We have the first gospel proclamation in Genesis 3 back in the garden. So the gospel isn't something new. Paul is teaching us the gospel is confirmed through the Old Testament prophecies. This tells me that not only did God promise the gospel, but it, was tell, it tell, tells me, it teaches me that it was promulgated through the prophets. And so there's going to be some continuity between the Old and New Testament. There's another thing I want you to notice here. I want you to notice that Paul is following in the footsteps steps of Jesus in the way he taught. Turn back over to Luke 24. Luke 24. Pick up the reading in verse 25. Now this is when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus, but he's, he's talking to these people and he says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, 
It's low far to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But he constrained them, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to, in to stay with them. And it came to pass, he sat at the table with them, and he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us when he taught with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So God, God himself, God in flesh, is opening the scriptures to them, taking them back to the Old Testament, saying, none of these things should have surprised you if you knew your scriptures. Right? Turn back over to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. Pick up the reading in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was his custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. He says in verse 21, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which were proceeded from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also in your country. And then he says, Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut for three years and six months. And there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, the region of Sidon, to the woman who was a widow. And many of the lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, he went on his way. But notice here, this helps me to understand how to handle the Old Testament. It tells me that the message of the Old Testament was prepared uh, so that God's people would understand and know the arrival of the Messiah who would save them from their sins. And so when you put all this together, you realize the gospel was not some divine afterthought. It was something that was promised by God. And so this teaches us that what God promises, he will bring to pass. So now go back over to Romans 1. We want to understand something of the trustworthiness of the message that we have, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now remember, Paul was accused of teaching a doctrine that contradicted the Old Testament. He was accused, for example, of teaching against Moses. But Paul emphasizes up front that the message he's bringing is the good news. It's the good news that was sourced in God and was originated in God, but it was promised beforehand in the Old Testament. And so keep in mind, the Holy Scriptures are a different category than, say, for example, the rabbinical uh, writings that were promoted in the first century Judaism. The Gospel was not the focal points of those writings when you read through them. Most of the Jews of that day were accustomed to listening to these uh, rabbinical traditions for religious guidance. In the words of one, the Holy Scriptures were looked on more as a sacred relic than as the source of truth. And, and we see something very similar to that in our day, right? We've replaced the truths of the scriptures with man-derived doctrine. And so, what's at the focal point, the hallmark of man-derived doctrine in our day and age? Well, it's pragmatism. It's all man-centered. It's all about making you feel good about yourself. You don't want to feel guilty of your sins. Right? If we don't understand and recognize something of the severity of our sins, then we will never go to our Savior. We will never experience the good news. We don't need these pragmatic man-made doctrines. What these doctrines do is they take the glory away from God by undermining His wisdom. We need to make sure we don't substitute the truths of God's Word with some kind of man-made philosophy or doctrine. Throughout history, uh, if you study out church history, you're going to see in the church, you see the Jews resisted the gospel by arguing that uh, <coughs> if we embrace the gospel, we're going to have to reject our heritage. 
Now that's an interesting response by the Jews, isn't it? On one level, they do have to reject their heritage, right? The part of their heritage they have to reject is that part that's based on human traditions. But you know, they're not unique. We all have to do that. To become a Christian, we have to abandon and deny heritages that, uh, and cultural norms that are in violation of the truths of God's holy word. But the Jews' greatest heritage is the promise of God's Messiah, and that's what they were not embracing. And so when a true Jew becomes a Christian, he embraces his true heritage, which is grounded in the Messiah. And so when I read Romans 1-2, he's pointing me back to the Old Testament, and it's estimated that at least 332 prophecies about Christ could be found in the Old Testament. And when you start reading through the New Testament, you start reading how uh, we see... The fulfill, how Christ fulfills those prophecies, it's really mind-boggling. And this is why Paul makes this statement. It's one of the strongest proofs concerning the origin of the gospel that he preached. It establishes the veracity of God's word. God promised these things that his Messiah would do, and his Messiah comes upon the scene, and he accomplishes these things. Charles Hodge, commenting on this verse, writes, the advent, the character, the work, the kingdom of the Messiah are there predicted, and it was therefore out of the scriptures that the apostles reasoned to convince the people that Jesus is the Christ, and to this connection between the two dispensations they constantly refer in proof of their doctrine. So the Old Testament taught the gospel. I mean, we see this in Genesis 3.15 as uh, God is pronouncing the curse over the serpent. He reminds us that it is the seed of the woman that would crush the head of Satan. We have the first gospel proclamation there in Genesis 3.15. Turn back over to Galatians 3 for just a second. Notice what Paul says over here in Galatians 3 as he's pointing us back to the Old Testament. He says in Galatians 3.8, he says, In the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying in you all the nations shall be blessed so we see that when God made a covenant with Abraham what was he doing he was proclaiming the gospel according to Paul and the good news was this all the nations would be blessed by this Jewish Messiah this is why Christ would say for example in, in John 8 56 your father Abraham rejoiced that he could see my day and he saw it and was glad now, according to Jesus, Abraham had a great understanding concerning what God would do through his son, his greater son, the Messiah. And Abraham rejoiced. Abraham rejoiced to see that day. So I want us to understand that the message of the gospel is found in the Old Testament. And this is why we continue to study the Old Testament. It's so beneficial. It's so useful for us. All right, number three. What was the instrument by which God communicated this message, Right? Look at verse 2 again, in Romans 1 2. Which he, God, promised before through his prophets. So the instrument that God used to proclaim the gospel before Christ comes upon the scene is his prophets. They were God's prophets, which gives them great dignity. They belong to God. One writes it this way The prophets were not some evolutionary product of their time, but men endowed with God's Spirit to foresee the gospel message. So turn over to Hebrews 1. Let's look at a couple passages. In Hebrews 1, pick up the reading in verse 1. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So God spoke by means of the prophets. This means that God communicated his message through them. And within their message, I mean, a lot of times we think about the prophets just coming around and, you know, all they're doing is just doom and gloom, right? They were speaking judgment to the covenant breakers, right? Remember, what was the prophets, one of their primary duties? It was to press the terms of the covenant. And Israel had broken the terms of the covenant over and over again. But also within their message, they're speaking a message of hope to the remnant, those who had remained faithful to God throughout the land. And so God, through that uh, message of judgment to the covenant breakers, always has a message of hope to those who are faithful, the remnant. Turn over to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. 
Look at verse uh, 10. Of this salvation, Peter writes, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Right? So Peter recognizes the prophets spoke of the grace that would come to those after them, after the prophets wrote. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And then he says in verse 12, To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Every Jewish prophet either directly or indirectly prophesied uh, towards, pointed people towards, put the light upon the true prophet which was Jesus Christ. That phrase, carefully search and inquiry, is intensive. This means they sought out, they scrutinized with care the revelations made to them that they might understand exactly what was implied in which you know, the, the things that they were prophesying about. So let's stop and ask. Uh, for Christians who don't, we've dealt with this in the past, but let's ask the question again. For those who won't put on the gospel shoes, why? Some people say, well, you know, I just don't like talking to people. I don't feel very clever. Well, we dealt with that with Paul. Paul said, I didn't come to you with the excellence of speech or the, the wisdom of men. So we dealt with that. A lot of times what happens is we don't put on the gospel shoes because we don't want to take the time to scrutinize what the texts actually say. So we don't have a message to bring because we don't know it. I mean, we would all agree we can't teach what we don't know. And that's where a lot of Christians are, I think. Well, so what's a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks for God. A prophet is a proclaimer. He's an interpreter of divine revelation. In a biblical sense, the prophets were men who God raised up to declare his will to that nation. And we're going to see from their pattern that uh, to proclaim the will of God comes really at great expense in a fallen world. If we're going to proclaim the message of peace, the gospel of peace, it may come at great expense. And if you go back and spend some time looking at the prophets, that's most of them, it cost them a lot to be faithful to the message that God had given to them. Turn over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. You say, well, that's probably true in those pagan nations, those people that just don't know any better. Who were the prophets sent to? They were sent to the religious people. Matthew 23. And those religious people can be some of the harshest ones we have to deal with. But in Matthew 23, look at verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets, you adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. I mean, have you heard people say, oh, if we just had a Martin Luther. Oh, if we just had a John the Baptist. The church today would not want them. The question is, would we want them? Would we want them coming here? He says in verse 31, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. He says, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed from on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murder between the temple altar. And surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your chicken, gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Well, notice here, that's really strong language against you know, the religious leadership of Israel. But the people of God were guilty of killing God's prophets. They were ultimately guilty of killing the greatest prophet, God's son. And in this chapter, Jesus is laying the indictment at the feet of the Pharisees. And he says, you're guilty. You cannot escape the condemnation of hell. As a result, I'm going to judge you. And we know that judgment fell upon these Jews in 70 AD in a gruesome fashion. But as we read this section, we see that the prophets, the messengers of God, they are important to God. And this is why we're seeing here an assault on the messengers of God are seen as an assault upon God. This is why, for example, when um, uh, Saul of Tarsus is, is issuing out threats and he's going 
to uh, persecute. He's on the road to Damascus. He's there to persecute the Christians. That's why Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? An assault on the body of Christ is an assault on Christ himself. But these men were not only sent to call Israel to repentance, they were sent to proclaim the gospel as well to encourage the remnant. They're there for the, for the, the, the true people of God. Turn back over to Romans 1. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets. So we have this little small parenthetical statement here in the introduction. It's here to help those who are reading that, uh, you know, the gospel Paul's bringing, the, Paul, the gospel that Paul is teaching is not some man-made derived, some man-derived religion. It's grounded upon the Old Testament's writings which were given to the people of Israel through the prophets. All right. One more point about the trustworthiness of these documents. Look at verse 2 again. Which he promised before through his prophets where? In the Holy Scriptures. I've got to understand these written documents. If I'm to understand something of the trustworthiness of the message, I need to understand the documents. And Paul says the message of good news was written beforehand by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And the emphasis here is on the word holy. Uh, this is emphasized the character of these documents. These are his writings. These are his prophets and his holy writings. Good news was presented to us in God's holy writings. So, you know what this means? This means we're not to look anywhere else for the good news except here in these holy documents. The message is not to be found in um, mystical visions or inward intimations. The message is not found in any non-biblical, non-objective way. The message is grounded here. The message is found here in the documents that we can all read and we can all study. We can ponder these words. We can understand them. This means there's no human composition or this is not human speculation. When it comes to the book, when it comes to the scriptures, it's the very revelation of God. Now, there's an error that's been going on around for a long time, since the early 1900s. And this error falls under the heading of neo-orthodoxy. And when I think of this, I think of men like Karl Barth, uh, some of the old uh, neo-orthodox Germans that, that issued in uh, a lot of false teachings and, and uh, error. But in this view, uh, the neo-orthodox view, they don't really see the Bible as the Word of God, but rather it becomes the Word of God in a moment of crisis in your experience. And so the idea here is that uh, as you read the Bible and a verse begins to speak to you in a very special, particular way at that moment, then it becomes the Word of God. You see a problem with that? You ever met people like this? becomes very, very subjective, doesn't it? They read a text of Scripture, snatch it out of its context, and you can make this thing say anything you want it to say. And so these types of people, they don't really have value in the Scriptures at all. And they certainly wouldn't view this as holy. But they're wrong. Every book, every chapter, every verse, every word is from God. And the idea here is that nothing whatsoever is lacking in the Holy Scriptures. I mean, isn't this what, uh, turn over to 2 Timothy 3, isn't this what Tent Paul tells Timothy? In verse 16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. And because of that, it's profitable. Profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You ever met these one-dimensional Christians? They got their favorite two, three verses and they build their whole life around that, but not the whole counsel of God. But all scripture is profitable. And so if you're going to be thoroughly equipped in every good work, we need to know the totality of the book, become familiar with it. So notice Paul says in Romans 1 2, which he God promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. There's all kind of verses that support this idea that these words are holy because they come from God himself. Uh, turn over to Acts 1. Acts 1. We'll go through several of these. Look at Acts 1, verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a God for those who arrested Jesus. Notice here, do you see it? The Holy Spirit through the mouth of David spoke. This means that the Holy Spirit guided, the Holy Spirit directed David to quote this statement. And this statement would then be used here in Acts. The words penned by David were inspired by God himself, and so they're trustworthy. They're to be believed. They're to be obeyed. 
Turn to Acts 3. Acts 3, look at verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Notice God has spoke through the prophets, his holy prophets. These are men that have been set aside, been consecrated to God. Turn to Acts 4, look at verse chapter, uh, chapter 4, look at verse 25. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. What's he quoting there? Y'all know? Psalm 2. We just sang it this morning, right? God spoke through David. And the point of this is that God had David to record exactly what God wanted him to record. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the one that God the Father says, ask of the nations, I'll give them to you. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, look at verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial of the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my way, so I swore my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Notice here, um, the, the, the writer of Hebrews here is quoting Psalm, the Old Testament. And, and the writer of Hebrews gives credit to who? Therefore the Holy Spirit says. The point again is that the Holy Spirit wrote this through the instrumentality of men. Look at uh, Hebrews 4, look at verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in data, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Well, we have this verse quoted, right? But the writer of Hebrews says, David said this. So here he says, David says this statement. But back in chapter 3, he says the Holy Spirit said it. So who said it? Well, they both did. Because the Holy Spirit inspired David to write this. The Holy Spirit spoke through the mouth of David. And as a result, we have Psalm 95. And Psalm 95 is captured there for us. And, and the New Testament uses it to remind these Jewish readers who were threatening to leave the Christian faith due to persecution. He's saying, don't do this. Just remember what God said in the past. One more. Go to 2 Samuel 23. Just one more thing I want you to see here. Second Samuel 23 says, Now these are the last words of David. Verse 1. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So when we come to these writings, they're holy writings, because they come from God. So when we talk about the trustworthiness of the message, let's talk about the origin, let's talk about the, the confirmation, let's talk about the channel or the means, but we've got to talk about these documents. And since they're from God, they're authoritative, they are sufficient. And this is important for us to understand because the Jews of Paul's day have replaced the authoritative word of God with their man-made traditions. It's easy for us to go look back at the first century and say, yeah, how could they do this? How could they ever put their traditions of men above the word of God? But church history reveals to us that the church has struggled with this distinction. And there, there's been in all ages this tendency to gravitate towards tradition as the source of authority. The church has had a tendency to um, mix a little bit of tradition and a little bit of scripture together. And when tradition becomes the lens by which we begin to interpret the scriptures, then that's what becomes authoritative, is our traditions. Turn to Mark 7. Mark 7. This is an important section for us to grasp because... Um, Christ makes it clear to the Jews that their traditions were actually nullifying the scriptures. And that's what we do when we bring traditions to the table as well, right? I mean, as you're turning there to Mark 7, I mean, the classic example is, you know, God and the American flag and mom and apple pie. We bring those traditions to the table. And what that does is it prevents us as Christians to say, all right, who are the true patriots of this land? 
The true patriots of this land are the same patriots in Israel's day, like Isaiah, like Jeremiah. Those men who faithfully took the word of God to their countrymen. Why? Because they hated him? No, because they love truth, they love their God, and they love their countrymen. We need to be careful that we're not bringing these false ideas, these traditions to the table. Mark 7, look at verse 6. And he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy, you hypocrites, as it is written, uh, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, the cups, and the many other things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father and mother, what pro Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down to many, and many do such things. So this is a rebuke. This is one of the you know one of the most harshest rebukes that Christ can give. Christ is teaching the Jews that, you know. Tradition has no legitimate place of authority over the people of God. Everything must be tested by the Word of God. Putting tradition <coughs> over the Word of God is a serious transgression. And as a result, we need to make sure we're not making the same mistake. So let's look at some examples. The Catholic Church, for example, was guilty of following the tra tragic mistake of Judaism. The Catholic Church in particular has its own form, its own body of tradition that functions exactly like the Jewish Talmud did. So how did this happen? Well... Uh, the early church, if you read their writings, placed a strong emphasis on the authority of scriptures. So why would I say that? Well, go back and look at the great controversies of the early church. Uh, when they argued over matters such as the deity of Christ, his two natures, the trinity, the doctrine of original sin, the early church council settled disputes by appealing to the scriptures as the highest authority. The church didn't issue some ex cathedra dec decree in the early centuries. They argued from the scriptures. Now, as wicked men came into authority over the Catholic Church, uh, they began to fabricate tradition uh, to justify their unbiblical practices that were going on. The church began to play on the fears of superstitious people. Instead of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, the church began to keep the people in darkness by keeping them ignorant of the Word of God. And they began to teach the Scriptures just too complicated, right, for ordinary men to understand. I don't know how in the world those fishermen under Jesus ever figured this out. Right? The Scriptures... You know, when you read through the scriptures and you, you begin to kind of get your hands around, most of what is being taught to us is not too complicated. It's just in our sin nature, we just don't want to submit or bow to it. The teachings appear to be very clear. But, you know, the great deception that began, you know, that, that the Catholic Church, they begin to create all kind of new and novel doctrines. Uh, such as the veneration of the saints and angels, Mariology, Immaculate Conception, the view of marriage as the co-mediatrix with Christ, purgatory, indulgences. But none of these can be sustained from the scriptures. These are just products of Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, and, and the Catholic Church doesn't make any apologies for their tradition, for their views on tradition. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they acknowledge this, and this is what they write, does not derive her certainty about revealed truths from holy scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. So, tradition, according to Rome, is therefore much of the word of God as scripture. Listen to these words. Tradition and scripture are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them flowing out from the same divine wellspring come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. The sacred deposit of faith, this admixture of scripture and tradition, was entrusted by the apostles to their successors. And so this interpretation of tradition was given uh, to um, the living teaching office of the church alone. And so this means the task of interpreting has been entrusted to the bishops. And so what this does is it not only puts the tradition on equal footing with the scriptures, it becomes, um, well, it becomes tradition is not written in just these documents, but mystically within the church herself. I don't know how you would ever, and, and this is the problem with the Catholic Church, you cannot take their understanding of tradition and hold it to any kind of standard. And this is why when you look at from one pope to the next, it begins to kind of really kind of evolve. And so when the church speaks, her voice is heard as though it were the voice of God. And when this happens, as we saw in the days of the Reformation, ultimately tradition supplants and supersedes the scriptures. Well, 
It was inexcusable when the Jews put traditions over the scriptures and it's inexcusable for the Catholic Church to follow in the footsteps. God gave us his word in written format for a reason, to make it permanent. The truth of God is not to be tampered with. Turn over to Deuteronomy 4, just so we understand the seriousness of this. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 says this, You shall not add to the word which I command to you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So you can't add to this word. And in Deuteronomy 12, 32, Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add or take from it. So the revealed word of God and nothing else was supposed to be the supreme authority over Israel. I mean, this is why, for example, God told Joshua uh, in Joshua 1, 7, Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you shall be careful, or you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And so the point here, I think you get it, is that the word of God was to be the standard. God did not instruct Joshua to look to the traditions to, um, uh, to guide him, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, his law that he has written, you know, put in written form for us. And so we need to make sure we're not guilty of the same sin you know, um, the Protestant churches, we can make holy days from tradition that are not, you know, not from the scriptures and make them, you know, unbiblical as well. Uh, the Protestant church is based on things that are really, re- really, if you think about what they're doing, is based on tradition rather than scripturated word of God. Let me give you a few things to think about. I think about altar calls. It's pretty widely accepted. Not because you can find it in the scriptures. It's just, it's just a, become a tradition. And it's a great time at the end of the service to manipulate. If I can get the music just right, if I can just keep on, keep on, keep on, somebody eventually will come down. When you read in the New Testament, for example, when the Spirit fell on somebody and convicted them of their sins, you didn't have to manipulate them to come down front. What were they doing? Brother, tell me what I need to do to be saved. You couldn't keep them. You didn't have to manipulate them to do anything. So when I think of altar calls... I can't find that in the scriptures. Here's another one. Think about different ceremonies that happen with babies in different denominations. I think about what the Methodists do with their children, or the Anglican, or the Presbyterians, or the Lutheran, or even the Southern Baptists with their little baby dedications. Every one of them's different. Have you ever wondered why all of them are so different? You know? You know why they're all different? It's because you can't find them in the Bible. It's not grounded. It's, it's just denominational tradition. And so, if it's not granted in the scriptures, and you're just going to make up a little ordination service, you can make it do and say whatever you need it to do and say. So each one of these groups try to come up with clever ways to get around baptismal regeneration, but they all are different because it's not based upon scripture. Think about the different programs found within the different churches. When you, you talk to churches and find out, well, why do you have all these different programs? Why is your overhead budget so high? Not based upon the scriptures, and they can't normally they can't defend their practices from the scriptures. These different churches have been incorporating these foreign practices within their churches for long. It's just become their tradition, and then after a couple of generations, you don't even question it anymore. Well, it's just what we do. Well, there's a lot of things we can talk about within the Protestant groups that have replaced the scripture with some kind of tradition. What we need to do as a church is just to make sure we stay grounded in the scriptures, be content to apply God's will, and keep the simplicity of the church here. And so what do we say about direct revelation? Because this is another problem you guys are going to be confronted with as you go and you take the gospel out there. Listen to some of these statistics. In Germany, there's 30,000 clergy of all kinds, but there's 90,000 witches and fortune tellers. In France, 26,000 Roman Catholic priests, but 40,000 astrologers. So when we talk about direct communication, by definition, it's new revelation. Um, do you see what new revelation implies? New revelation implies that the scriptures are not sufficient. Listen to our Baptist confession of faith. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory and salvation, faith and life is expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture. Unto which nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelation of the spirit or the tradition of men. That's a great statement. So, when we hear words of wisdom or knowledge from individuals who have gotten a word from God, we need to dismiss this because while we have what we need found grounded here in God's word, we need to believe that God's word is holy. 
it's not on the same plane as the Quran or these other religious writings or the Book of Mormon or the, you know, even this new um, Kingdom Revelation over there by the Jehovah's Witnesses. They've kind of rewritten some things to, you know, make their Aryan views stick. And so we shouldn't apologize either for our allegiance to God and to His Word. We need to study it. We need to obey it. We need to proudly proclaim it without fear. If you remember, you know. Um, in our confession, we also have this statement found in our confession. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and diverse manners to reveal Himself and to declare that His will or declare his will, excuse me, unto the church. Well, there's a lot within that statement, but it teaches us that saving knowledge is found only within the holy documents. God in his good and kind providence did not leave us to wander around in the darkness to try to figure out what he wants, what makes him happy, what pleases him. Rather, he has revealed himself to the prophets, and ultimately he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. God ordained that the words of the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus were written down for our benefit. And so we need to see these words as precious. Turn over to 2 Timothy 4. Do you think Paul thought uh, the documents, the words of God were precious? I never believe he did. Notice this in 2 Timothy 4. Look at uh, verse 13. So, you know, he's writing from prison. He's saying, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come in the books, especially the parchment. Paul's writing Timothy from prison. What does Paul want? I want the scriptures. He wants the parchments. So I think Paul sees the scriptures as something precious. So when I read these verses in Romans 1, I see um, the trustworthiness of the message. I understand its origin. It's a gospel. It's the gospel sourced in God. It comes from God. I see the confirmation. I see the channel through whom it was given. His holy men wrote these words, and he put them down in holy writings for our benefit. Now listen to these words from J.I. Packer because this is how it begins to, you know, what does this got to do with spiritual warfare? J.I. Packer said this, If I were the devil, one of my first aims would be to stop folks from digging into the Bible. I mean, certainly we've seen in history where, um, you know, wicked cultures have tried to burn the Bible and try to keep it out of your hands. Nobody's burning Bibles in this country. What's keeping it out of our hands? It's our desire for worldliness. It's our desire to be entertained. When you, you think about why it is when I hear people say I, I, I don't have time to read God's word I doubt that I seriously doubt that if I were the devil one of my first aims would be to stop to, to stop folks from digging into the Bible I should do all I could do to surround him with spiritual equivalents of pits thorns hedges and man traps to frighten people off when we talk to people today they, they get the lamest excuses for that why they can't read God's word but listen to what George Whitfield said God has condescended to become an author and yet people will not read his writings there are very few that gave this book of God, the Grand Charter of Salvation, one fair reading through. It's kind of interesting when you go out and poll and talk to Christians and say, you just read the Bible through? Do you understand who wrote it? Who condescended to give it to you? It's a little convicting, isn't it? And then you say, I'm not sure why I won't put the gospel shoes on. Well, we come to the message. We need to understand the trustworthiness of it that because it comes from God. He has confirmed that this is nothing new. It's been revealed in the past. The message of the gospel was announced a long time ago. God gave the message through his prophets, and um, here's the product, right? We now have God's holy writings here with us today. And so we understand something of Paul's words to the Corinthians. Paul did not use his human reasoning. He didn't stoop to human speculation, but rather he preached from the Scriptures. He said that his only desire was to preach Christ and him crucified. That should be our desire. We have been made stewards of the gospel. Remember, we talked about this last time. We are ambassadors of the gospel. Therefore, we should be good stewards by proclaiming the message that's been given to us. We should preach Christ, preach him crucified, because we understand that it's through the message that the Lord penetrates the heart. If we want to see a demonstration of power, we must teach, we must preach, Preach, we must proclaim the true gospel. And it's through this message that God brings faith into the heart of the individual. 
D.A. Carson wrote, It is not arrogance to represent as forceful as we can God's gospel in faithful stewardship. You remember Paul's words to Timothy? Paul told him to preach the word. That should be our desire. We have to agree that this is a great message. Now, as we get ready to close out our time this, this afternoon, I, I hope you begin to see the importance of God's word. I hope you understand that the Bible is not some man-made religion. That's Paul's point here in Romans. He was arguing that the gospel was sourced in God. Uh, it's demonstrated by the fact that he promised beforehand by God in the Old Testament. So here's the first question. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the gospel was prophesied about in the Old Testament? You see, as you really come to grips with that truth, it's going to encourage you to go out and share the gospel with those, even those who might mock you and ridicule you for doing so. If you believe that this document is inspired, the inspired word of God, what should our response be? If we truly believe this truth, what should our response be? I think it should be, number one, to study its content and become familiar with with God's will for us. I think we should give ourselves to that. Study its content. You know, we just prayed last Wednesday night, we just prayed this morning that 2021 will be the year that we draw closer to God in fellowship. So you've got to take stock in your own life and ask yourself, what is hindering you from drawing closer? Well, if you think you're going to draw close to Him by sliding His Word aside, you've come up with some new mechanism that the Bible's foreign. The Bible just doesn't teach that. So I've got to study his content. I got to, you know, God is telling me who he is in his word. Number two, I should begin to apply these contents in my life. If I, as I begin to study his contents, I begin to see that God, uh, it is his desire that I obey these contents. I see that it brings him pleasure and honor and glory for me to submit to his will. And then number three, if I believe this is the revealed word of God, then I need to share its contents with others. I should certainly start in my own home. I should start sharing the contents with my direct family, my most direct sphere of influence. And as I do that, I go out. As the circles of influence go out further and further and further, we need to begin to instruct those that we come into contact from the Scriptures. And so if I'm not doing that, what does that tell you? I don't really believe that it's from the Lord. I should share it. I should share it with my extended family, my friends, my coworkers, people that I come into contact with day in and day out. And so if we're not willing to study out the contents of the Word of God, if we're not willing to begin to apply its contents, if we begin to refuse to share with others, then we demonstrate that uh, we don't really believe the Word of God. I mean, go back and and read through Acts again. Go back and read through um, Paul's letters, for example, and see he believed all three of these points. He believed the Word of God. We see it because he studied it. We see that he began to apply it in his life. We see that he shared it with anybody that would just sit down and listen to it. Let me ask you this. Does this do these three principles describe you? If not, then we need whatever area that we're struggling with, we need to, to repent, right? And so if you're not aligning yourself with the Word of God in every area, then let me ask you this question. How's that area of your life going? How's it working out for you? You see, if we don't apply the Word of God to our own lives in every area, then then um, what you're doing is you're applying your own finite wisdom in that area. And, and your limited experience, and, and you're trying to pile your finite knowledge, your limited experience up against the infinite wisdom of God. That sounds foolish, but that's exactly what we do. So may God grant us a hunger and a thirst for His Word. You know, I, I pray that our children would desire to feast upon His Word and apply it in their lives. And I hope you're beginning to see how this ties to the gospel shoes. If we don't have a high view of God's Word, this whole idea of putting gospel shoes on really has a little relevance to you, doesn't it? So we need to go back and make sure we have a high view of God's Word that's authoritative, it's sufficient, it's necessary for every area of my life. It should show itself, that should manifest itself to those who are out sharing the gospel with. But we're to go with these gospel shoes to take us to the battlefield. We shouldn't allow the fact that there's going to be opposition and conflict to surprise us. That's what happens when you wage war. We're calling people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And if we're going to stand and stay on the battlefield, we need to have the right shoes on. That's what Paul's calling us to in this spiritual warfare. So I'm going to close here at this moment, and uh, Lord willing, we'll continue to pick up our study of the spiritual warfare next week. But uh, give this some serious thought and consideration. And if you need to, go back and listen to the other sermons uh, leading up to this one. Uh, but if we're going to have the gospel shoes on, you got to believe in the Great Commission. 
you're, you know, by what right do you have to walk up to somebody and tell them to repent? Well, the King of Kings, the one that conquered death, he's the one that gave you the right. So you don't have to make any apologies. You don't have to make any excuses to that hard-headed person you're trying to talk to. Who? How dare you? I'll tell you how dare I. The one who conquered death said I needed to. He told me to do this. You need to repent. You need to quit rebelling against your Creator. You're going to experience peace with Him. You're going to live in eternity with Him. We need to also understand that we are His ambassadors and we have a great message. It is the shoes of gospel of peace. And so reconciliation is a great part of the gospel. We can be reconciled to the God that we are enemies with. There's enmity that exists and hostility that exists between our Creator and us as descendants of Adam. Christ has wiped all that away so that we can have friendship with God. And we see in the gospel that God the Father sent God the Son who took upon flesh, born of a woman, under the law so that he could redeem us and make us his sons and daughters. And then here, when you take this out, the, the, the thing you're going to deal with the most is people are going to challenge you on the veracity of that message. I hope I've convinced you this morning. Our message is grounded and sourced in God who taught these things, prophesied the good news in the Old Testament through his prophets and gave us these holy writings. There's your foundation. That's what you stand on. And here's the thing. We'll talk later on in our study of the sword of the Spirit. You're going to have these unbelievers. You're going to have these God-haters, these mockers of God. And they're going to say, you know, I don't want to hear your talk about the Scriptures. Well, what happens to a soldier when he lays his sword aside? Well, okay. Let me put my sword down. Understand, we give up our only weapon, the weapon of power when we give up the Scriptures. Now, here's the thing. You should not, and they will not. They're not going to give up their weapons, and you should never lay down your weapons. You can't fight a war without them. So we have the sword of the Spirit given to us for a reason, so that we may wage war against those who are rebelling against our God. And we are called as ambassadors to wield this weapon to call them to peace with our Creator. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your truths that are given to us in your word. We thank you that we have a sure foundation, which is the rock word of the Lord Jesus Christ that we stand upon. We thank you that you have sent your holy prophets in times past who have written down your word, even at great expense and great cost to them, so that we might have this sure foundation. Father, may we put our confidence in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we find and see power in our day through your word, through your spirit, as we faithfully obey it. May we not look to our own reasoning, our own uh, oratory skills. uh, But, Father, may we just trust in your power to convert the hardest of hearts and bring them into your kingdom. And so, Father, we pray that this time together this morning will encourage us to put the gospel shoes on, the gospel of peace, to cause those who are dying in their sins and trespasses who, if they die here in their sins and trespasses, will taste eternal wrath forever. So, Father, may we be bold, courageous with your gospel truth. May we take it to those who desperately need it. May we not be greedy uh, and cling on to that uh, ourselves or selfish, but may we just always, uh, in love, share the truth with those that need to hear it. So, Father, we thank you that you have sent others to us that we might hear it. Even when in our deadness of flesh, uh, our deadness in our sins and trespasses didn't want to hear it. You sent your gospel ministers to us to preach the gospel, and we thank you for them. We thank you for the means by which you save us. And so, Father, we pray that you would use us to take the glorious gospel, the gospel of peace, to those in our community. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.